Um, a very good day to you, ladies and gentlemen, in front of the screens. My name is Hannes Stram. I'm the cultural property protection expert in the Office of Cultural Affairs in the Principality of Liechtenstein. And today I have the pleasure to introduce you to a um, very important topic when it comes to extraordinary events, or more specific, to emergencies. As I chose to express extraordinary, I wanted to emphasize the circumstance that they do not happen very often. Normally, statistically, in over 95% of all cases, we are allowed to live our lives as usual and follow our daily routine. Nevertheless, as soon as it comes to such an event, it happens suddenly, with no or just very little advance warning time and with unpredicted, enormous, fundamental changing and disastrous consequences. The only way to cope with such situations adequately is to find ways to foresee, foresee and predict them, to prepare for them, and to have processes in place to react on them efficiently and effectively. That's why I'm going to talk today about emergency management, and therefore, I want to follow the following agenda. First of all, I want to show you emergency management model, uh, the one we use in Liechtenstein, where you can um, um, identify different phases and um, ideas. Then the emergency management systems, uh, why they are important, and management, uh, emergency management structures, what they are about, decision-making processes for what they are uh, and why we need them. And in the end, um, I want to talk about preparation and, tra and training. <clears throat> Come on, coming to the emergency management model that we use in, uh, in Liechtenstein, I use the one um, we have in our cultural property protection manual and guidelines, which are downloadable at our homepage uh, from the Office of Culture, Cultural Affairs. Um, As I already mentioned, the answers to emergency events, um, you find here um, all the points uh, which I have already mentioned in the graphics timeline. In the normal phase here, during normal conditions, in, uh, in, in, in the phase of damage prevention, a risk management is conducted. A risk management takes um, the probability um, of an event to occur and combines it with the maximum damage uh, in connection with worth and meaning it will cause, uh, as the event will cause, and then develop strategies to tackle such risks. When it comes then to an event, it's all about damage minimization and damage reduction. So we do we have there some kind of intervention. Uh, the intervention is with measures which are prepared, hopefully via an emergency plan, um, which has uh, written in it and, and uh, um, predicted um, protection measures, safety and security measures, safeguarding measures, and also stabilization measures. This phase ends as soon as the event is over, the event is over as soon as we, we are again free to decide how to react on uh, the outcomes of such an event uh, in, a, in a calm way. After that, the recovery phase starts uh, with the damage management recuperation, it's called, meaning coming back to the status where we were before the event, or trying at least. Um, in such a phase, a restoration measures, construction measures, a reconstruction measures um, are taking place and have to be conducted to reach again the normal condition, the normal phase. But then it's not over. We have to start again with the risk management process to be prepared for such an event and to tackle risks we find out. To have such an model running and to be able to um, go through all these phases 
we need systems to react adequately and to uh, in an effective and efficient manner. So, what are emergency management systems? Actually, I just chose management systems because management systems are also there for um, being valid in emergencies. So, when we talk, for example, in military about management systems, they are always um, able to be laid on emergency situations. What are emergency management systems? They are the basis for the completion of tasks and issues. They are the basis for higher leadership performance and high quality decisions. They give us the ability to react and adapt in changing situations. They ensure survival and endurance of personal and material and they guarantee some kind of interoperability, meaning the working together with other systems, with other organizations, and so on. Reading these bonus points, it seems logic to have such a system implemented, but how many institutions do you know that operate after something like that? Or what does it mean or contain such a system? So the system I'm going to show you is a system that I borrowed from the Austrian Armed Forces. Um, and it defines itself in four pillars, why are four pillars, which include all necessary factors to be able to withstand and persist in such situations. The first pillar here, management organization, uh, contains functions, meaning who is in charge, who is responsible for what, basic material like guidelines, like info uh, material we use during our work, uh, communication information systems that ensure the information management, the flow and the connection between uh, our troops and also um, our forces, and in the end, structure. How do we work together? So the second pillar are management instruments like reporting systems, supervision, simulation, etc. I'm not going to go deeper in that. That's some kind of an old science. Um, the fourth or uh, third pillar are principles. Principles, they are very important as to define how we work <clears throat> and what our priorities are. They should be found through the whole, emer uh, whole emergency management process on, in the whole emer uh, emergency management systems. They are the base for all our actions and they define our values, how we work. And in the end, the fourth pillar is the decision-making process. There it is about the production of decisions. How that works, I'm going to show you later. This is one of the most important pillars in the system. So. The next thing I'm going to talk about are structure and the decision-making process ending with training. A management mer uh, emergency management structure, sorry for that. Why do we need structures? Um, they guarantee the determination of responsibilities of ta and tasks. Um, they ensure regulation of, management, uh, of a management process. They ensure the interaction of available elements. Um, we have to imagine in such a situation, we have many different tools. So um, somehow we uh, have to cope with them. Somehow we have to organize them and somehow we have to coordinate them. And doing that alone is a very hard job. So um, a structure gives us some advice as how to deal with something like that. Then we have um, structures ensure the solving of complex problems that they do, as they have also um, processes included, how we come to problem-solving uh, uh, advices. 
enable the use of standardized techniques and procedures, sustainable, operabil uh, sustainable operability. It's clear, if an organization uses the same processes and techniques, everybody knows them, everybody can, uh, uh, can practice them, and everybody can use them uh, to fulfill its tasks. And it's easy or more easy to overtake, for example, a task from someone else who is not able to fulfill it anymore due to different reasons. Yes, and it enables long-term management. What brings me to the last point? Um, here is that such systems have to last permanently. They have to last long. So when we have such a situation, it's not only for the situation, it's also for before the situation, during the situation, after the situation, after the event, that um, such structures um, are working. An example I want to show you here is the structure we have, for example, in Liechtenstein. You can, here you can see the cultural property protection management structure, which is built on the one hand side uh, downwards, starting uh, with international uh, and national requirements, like the Hague Convention, um, which are taken into account. Uh, to account. Um, but we take also into account the um, the requirements of a cultural asset uh, asset that is affected by an incident. Um, in such a system, you can find all necessary and all um, involved actors and with the lines are described then their role as well as their relation to each other and their responsibility. Going on with the next one, to manage such an emergency event, first response organization, emergency first response organ organizations use staff structures to create comprehensive decisions. Not only such organizations, but also economy-related companies and groups do use such staffs. It is not so important to know exactly the positions we find inside such a staff. Um, for example, there you can see in that cell, in the operation cell, the S2 who is responsible for military security, conflicting party situation, as it, um, I used here the, the, the example of a, a battalion stuff, a military battalion stuff. Um, there's three, the training of troops, execution of operations, PR, info ops, and so on. Uh, or the S4. Or the S4, which is um, responsible for logistics, the S1 for personal six, yes. Now, these functions, so you're not very important. Now, what is important for you to know is that it works in cells. So, um, this, these areas which, are, which work together have the different responsibilities. You have operation, the operation cell, which is responsible for how um, the, the organizations and the emergency responders work on the ground. Then you have a second cell, it's about logistics. Um, here's service, the service support cell. Uh, it provides uh, logistic um, needs for um, the, the boots on the ground for the organizations which cope with an event. And the third cell in this case is um, uh, the communication cell, the, the uh, communication information system cell, which is responsible for, um, uh, 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 for, for information flow and so on uh, dur during these, these two, two areas here. But all in all, this has to, be, has to be coordinated. And for that, it needs some kind of commander, a chief of, chief of staff, like we have it here. So actually, this example of a military battalion, standard battalion staff, is, um, shows it very clear what you need. And if you go on, for example, this is uh, now the structure. We have our um, cultural property uh, fast reaction element uh, implemented. There you can also um, identify these two uh, or three um, areas. Here the one, the operational one, the fast responding team. Here the logistic one, the logistic team. This here is for uh, uh, for enhancement. 
uh, and uh, for additional support uh, we get via um, our, our, our partners. And here we have the commanding cell. Um, so these areas like operations, logistics, commanding, also um, communication, but here not because it's included in, in, in the two cells here, um, you can always find in, um, in, in such emergency management structures to react adequately on um, situations. What brings me then to decision-making processes? Decision-making processes are another very important part of such a management system. It's a process that brings you, your staff, or your whole unit to a decision. There are different names for it, but it, it is, as it is, but as it decision making, let's call it decision making process here. Such a process is a, standard, a standardized process in which decisions are made, taking certain, taking certain principles into account and which are based on the assessment of all available information. It also includes the struct, uh, structured implementation of such, such decisions as orders, their distribution, execution, and control in order to be able to react to developments of the situation. So all in all, it is a circular process that allows to adapt to situations. Maybe you think choosing decisions is easy. In front of a traffic light, when you see red, it is to stop. When it's green, you can go. Often, emergency situations uh, uh, seem also very easy, but believe me, they aren't. That is why we use a decision-making process, because it's comprehensive. It's not just based on gut feeling. It's transparent, so if something goes wrong, everybody would have done it differently. That's, in, that's interesting then when it comes, for example, to a case in front of a court, in front of a judge. You need then some kind of um, proof that you reacted with all the knowledge you had. And that's why uh, you use the DMP. Um, we have to imagine that decisions trigger decision-making process uh, processes at every subordinate management level. Meaning when we are taking a decision, for example, in the staff, the subordinated units also do a decision-making process about that. So we always have to have in mind when we give a task, when we give an advice, the desired effect takes time to occur because our subordinated management, subordinated management levels also have to do their assessments and to um, give their orders. We also uh, have to have in mind when we, when we re regard this, that this side effect takes time to occur, that sudden changes of opinion or flashes of inspiration inside a planning team, inside which, which are not covered by a decision-making process, they uh, cause chaos on the ground. You can imagine that if you change your opinion more uh, um, often, that can um, have consequences, very serious consequences on the ground in such an event. <clears throat> Additionally, calculations and assumptions based on the management pro uh, procedure and um, enable a follow-up planning. That's also uh, often important to have in mind. As soon as, as you are done with the decision-making process and if, uh, um, the orders are given, another decision-making process has to start because what happens if the task you give to others, the order you give to others, are fulfilled? Then we need additional advice. So uh, all in all, the decision-making process is a circular running system which always guarantees an adaptation on the situation, as I already said. Um, here, you can see the decision-making process we use, for example, also in, in, uh, in Liechtenstein uh, on um, the community level. Um, starting such an event, you do normally always with an identification. 
with an identification of the situation. What is the problem? What do we know about the situation? Who else is here? Who else is involved? Um, these are very important things before we start acting. Otherwise, our uh, measures and our actions are not going to be efficiently and effectively. Or efficient and effective. So, um, after that, we are doing an assessment. The assessment has always on its ground and it, on its basis our task. So we have to um, ask ourselves, what is our task? What is, to, what is to be done additionally? What could happen when I do nothing? What options do I have? What do circumstances allow me to do? And when I have that, then I do considerations, and in the end, we can, uh, with conclusions, and in the end, we have then a decision here. And there's the question, what are we going to do to fulfill the task? How do we do it? And who does what? And that we are doing in an issue of order. Order, how is it called in Liechtenstein, a coordination report where everybody gets its tasks and um, we can start the reaction on, on the event. After that, the action starts, meaning the conduct of the operation. During this runs, uh, uh, the action run, uh, the action runs, um, we also have to do some kind of control. So do we reach the desired effect regarding the situation, regarding the problem? If not, I have to do again another identification. What is the problem? Why doesn't it work? What do I have? What did I do wrong? What uh, do I have to change in my um, in my movement, in my action, in my operation? Okay. So we see this is a, a, a circular system which uh, allows to adapt here, especially on the situation um, adequately. You always have to in mind, have to in mind, first you have to address the circumstance, then you have to assess it, and in the end you take a conclusion. What are we going to do about it? So that seems to make sense, doesn't it? That uh, something like such a system can work, needs training. So, and practice. That's why um, this aspect shouldn't be forgotten. Preparation and training is necessary. To be prepared, that's clear. To be trained, that's clear. To shorten the chaos phase. The chaos phase is that what happens after the event takes place. Nobody knows what to do or what's much more frightening. Everybody knows what to do. Um, in his own mind. Know the actors in the theater. That's important. When we work together with emergency first responding organizations, they have their principles, they have their uh, decision-making processes in place, uh, procedures and techniques. We don't know actually as specialists or as, um, as persons coming from somewhere else, at least if we are not also uh, firefighters in our free time. So we have to somehow um, adapt a bit on that because they are acting on the ground, not us. Enable communication within interfaces between institutions and emergency first responders. That means we need to work together with emergency first responders. We have to uh, know how they work. We have to give them an idea how we can support them. And so it will work. Be able to use material and equipment in an eff effective and an efficient manner. And be aware of everything that can go wrong will go wrong. So be prepared, train as you fight. This is the idea about it, and I'll show you how we do it in Liechtenstein. In Liechtenstein, we have, um, as you can see here, we try to connect our cultural property protection specialists and experts and personnel directly with the emergency first responders. 
with a firefighting unit in that case. For that, we have different levels, the basis level, um, the um, uh, event level, and the working level. Starting from the so basis level, where um, everybody who works in a cultural institution should be aware of what cultural property protection is and how it works when something happens and who is responsible. In the um, in the basis level, we also start with the officers from the firefighting units, from the, um, the fire department, uh, which have to know what is. What is, it, what is it about cultural, in cultural property protection? Uh, what are the, what is the cultural property on place? How to deal with it, and so on. And this goes through different levels, meaning from the beginners to the experts to the responding team, uh, uh, to, to the first response team, cultural property protection first response team in Liechtenstein, which is able to cooperate directly with uh, uh, with the firefighters. We achieve that by um, combined trainings, comprehensive trainings. And in the end, we also conduct exercises where they learn how to work together and what um, the speciality of each other is. So that ends my briefing about emergency management, emergency, emergency management systems emergency management structures, decision-making processes, and um, preparation and training. I hope um, I gave you some ideas what emergency management is and what is important about it. And never forget, these things don't take place very often, but we need to be prepared for them. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a nice day.